Welcome to Storytime from Space, a project of the Global Space Education Foundation. To learn how you can support this exciting project, please visit storytimefromspace.com. Hi everyone, I'm NASA astronaut Mike Hopkins here in the cupola and it's one of my favorite times. It's story time from space. And today we're going to read a story about Max again. And Max is going to Jupiter. And it's a science adventure with Max the dog. Uh, it's written by Jeffrey Bennett, Nick Schneider, and Erica Ellingson. Illustrated by Michael Carroll. And so looking forward to sharing this book with you. Again, we're in front of the cupola. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to see a few views of the Earth going by as I'm reading through this book. So this is the story of how Max the dog helped humanity leap beyond the realm of the inner solar system on a visit to explore the giant planet Jupiter and its wondrous moons. moons. And again, here's a, a note from the author. To children around the world, the future will be what you make it. Reach for the stars. It's another great message from uh, Jeffrey Bennett. Max was ready. His training was complete and his spacesuit fit perfectly. In a few days, he would be bound for Jupiter. Tori, now all grown up, would be the mission's chief scientist. Max's younger friends would stay behind, but they could see where he was going. Jupiter, king of the planets, is often the brightest object in the night sky. Tori showed the children how they could spot some of Jupiter's moons through binoculars. So now we can see, if you remember Tori in some of the earlier stories, she was uh, just a young girl, and now she's all grown up, and she's going to be the chief scientist. And it looks like they're looking for Jupiter, saying it's the brightest. That must be Jupiter right over there. Max was a natural choice to go along on the first human trip to Jupiter. After all, it was his grandfather, also named Max, who had been the first dog to go to the moon and Mars. Even as a puppy, Max had loved to sit in the lap of one of his human friends, listening to stories of his grandpa's space adventures. Now Max sat attentively while his friend Nathan talked about Jupiter's importance in human history. Jupiter has always been important in myth, he said, but about 400 years ago it helped change the entire course of human history. I know it sounds a little silly now, but at that time almost everyone believed that Earth was the center of the universe. So again, here is Max. I guess the original Max that went to the moon was his grandfather. Well, continued Nathan. In 1609, a man named Galileo built a telescope and started using it to study space. Galileo made many amazing discoveries, but I think the most important was when he found four moons orbiting around Jupiter. You know what that meant, right? Max, who was playing with the treat, appeared to have no idea. It was proof that not everything in the universe goes around the Earth, and it helped convince people that our Earth is just one planet orbiting one star and not the center of everything. Max. Exhibiting his troublesome streak, something his grandpa never had, jumped again and almost knocked Nathan over. So there you can see Nathan, and there's Max getting in trouble. Max wasn't done yet, but neither was Nathan. Today he concluded we know that Jupiter actually has dozens of moons, but the four discover discovered by Galileo, called Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto are by far the biggest of them all. The class applauded just as Max collided with Nathan and they crashed together to the ground. Hoping that would be the last crash, Max and his friends were soon off to a new human-made island in the eastern Pacific Ocean. There they boarded the space elevator, which would carry them straight up for almost three days until they were some 100,000 kilometers, or 60,000 miles, above Earth. The elevator rose faster than a jet airplane, but they felt little sensation of motion. They just watched Earth drop away as they rose and noticed their weight gradually lessen with the weakening gravity. 
And so here we can see Max knocking over Nathan, and then this is the space elevator. Now I had to come up here to the space station on a rocket, so this would be a little bit different way to get into space. Sounds pretty interesting. The Jupiter ship was anchored at the top of the elevator. Commander Grant and the rest of the crew were already on board, completing the final preparations. They were ready to go when Max and Tori arrived. It was time for the children to say goodbye and take the elevator back down to Earth. Children might someday go to Jupiter, but the first trip could take only grown-up astronauts and one dog. Tori was in charge of the daily video broadcast back to Earth, telling children about the trip. Jupiter is really far away, she explained. It is more than five times as far from the sun as Earth, which means our trip from Earth to Jupiter is almost 2,000 times as far as a trip from Earth to the moon. That's why it will take us months to get there, even though our ship has the most powerful rocket engines ever built. Our ship gives us artificial gravity by rotating, she continued, but it doesn't feel quite the same as being on Earth. Commander Grant says it makes him feel like a hamster on a wheel, but you can see that it doesn't bother Max. So here we can see the top of the elevator, and that must be the spaceship that's going to take them to, the, to Jupiter. And then here's Tori giving her broadcast back to the children on Earth. And you can see there's Max. He's playing in the artificial gravity. We don't have artificial gravity up here. So we're in a microgravity environment, which is why we can float, which is pretty fun. As the ship approached Jupiter, the crew fired the rocket engines, slowing their speed until Jupiter's gravity could hold them in orbit. They stared out the windows in awe as they orbited around Jupiter for the first time. Captain Anouche was the first to notice Earth in the distance. She couldn't help but marvel at the sight, especially as she thought about the different nationalities of all the crew members. It sure makes you think, she said. We all come from countries that used to fight each other. Now we are all working together here in a tiny ship from which our whole planet looks barely as large as a moat of dust. So there's the inside of the spaceship. Looks pretty cool. Their first science mission called for dropping a probe into Jupiter's atmosphere. Tori explained the goals. We can't land on Jupiter because it doesn't have a solid surface, and its winds are too strong to allow us to take a ship into its atmosphere. So we're going to send in this robotic probe, which will radio back information about Jupiter's clouds, winds, and gases. The rest of the crew prepared the probe. No one noticed Max's ball slipping into the airlock just before they closed the door. The crew watched excitedly as the probe shot out toward Jupiter. Equipped with the balloon, the probe would float in Jupiter's atmosphere for months. Max, looking out a different window, had other concerns. Fortunately, Tori had brought several balls with him on the ship. So there you can see Max's ball went outside. Although Max and the crew could not land on Jupiter, they could visit its moons. And we're actually going to take a pause right here because it's getting dark outside. Actually highlights that here on the International Space Station we actually travel around the Earth uh, 16 times a day. So that means we see 16 sunsets and sunrises. And so sometimes it can get hard if you're trying to, to get some things done during the daylight pass uh, to get it all done during that time. So we just, uh, I finished up with, uh, they just sent a probe down to, down to Jupiter. And so if you remember, again, uh, Max's ball uh, went out with, uh, with the probe. Although Max and the crew could not land on Jupiter, they could visit its moons. Their first stop was Io. They left the main ship in orbit while they descended to the surface in a small lander. As they walked on the bizarre surface, Tori reported back to children on Earth. When I say moon, she said, you probably think of a barren and cratered world like our own moon. But Io is not like that at all. As you can see, Io has volcanoes all over the place, and the ground is covered by this sticky dust. I've got to keep wiping my helmet visor so I can see. Suddenly, Tori's voice became panicked. Max, she yelled, come back. Unable to wipe off the dust, Max could not see where he was going. He heard Tori's call in his helmet radio, but he did not know which direction she was calling from. He was lost and wandering dangerously close to a river of hot lava. That could be dangerous. So here we are on the moon of Jupiter, Io, and you can see their little landing craft right there. 
and there's all this dust and so Max is having a hard time seeing and look there's the lava that could uh, that could hurt Luckily, Commander Grant saved the day, reaching Max just in time. Everyone was glad to get back to the lander. Tori had a little talk with Max as the lander rose up from Eo to return to the main ship. She hoped he would behave better at their next stop, which would be the science highlight of their trip. As they approached Europa, Tori broadcast her report back to Earth. Wow, she began. You can probably see in the pictures that this is no ordinary moon. On the outside, Europa is made mostly of ice, meaning frozen water. That's only the beginning of the excitement, she continued. Although we can't see it, we're almost sure that there's a giant ocean of liquid water under all that ice. In fact, we think there's more ocean water on Europa than on Earth. I can hardly wait to go down to the surface, said Tori. We're going to try to find a spot where the ice is thinner and launch our robotic submarine from there. So, Max getting in trouble, and now they're going to the moon Europa. The lander carried Max and the crew down to Europa's hard, icy surface. There was no dust here, but plenty of dangerous cliffs and crevices. Still, Tori figured Max could see, so she let him bring a ball to play with in the weak gravity. The crew was busy using sensors to measure the thickness of the ice in different places. Several minutes went by before anyone noticed that Max was missing. Oh no, not again, sighed Tori. They found him more than a kilometer away, where he chased after his ball as it had rolled downhill. Tori began to scold him. Max, are we going to have to leave you on the ship? But Commander Grant interrupted. Not so fast, he said, standing over the spot where Max's ball had come to rest. My sensor says this is the thinnest patch of ice anywhere around. Max, I think you found the spot for our submarine. They brought over the submarine, turned on its heater, and watched it begin to melt its way down to the ocean below. So here they are. There's Max with his ball, and there you can see the little submarine that they brought with them. Oops, I'm sorry. There's the little submarine that they brought with them. Back aboard the ship, Tori spoke to children on Earth about what the submarine would do. It will take a few weeks for the submarine to melt its way down into the ocean, she said, and then it will start transmitting pictures and other information back to us and to Earth. We can tell it where to go. We'll start by having it dive deep in search of undersea volcanoes. And of course, we'll be on the lookout for any signs of life. Do you think we'll find any? With their most important task accomplished, they decided to head for home. They flew past Ganymede so they could get a good look at the largest moon in the solar system. But they did not land there. Ganymede, Callisto, and Jupiter's many smaller moons would get their first footprints from future explorers. There was little to see out their windows on the long trip home so they often watched the big screen showing the video feed from the submarine. It was mostly dull, but one day... So that's, that's a picture of the submarine, and there's their spaceship getting ready to take them back home to Earth. They were all sleeping when Max started to bark. He ran over and licked Tori's face until she got up. Then he woke Commander Grant and then the rest of the crew. Long afterward, people still argued about whether it was a coincidence or whether Max really paid attention to the video screen. But coincidence or not, there was no doubt about what the crew saw on the screen. Living creatures were swimming in the ocean of Europa. Max was a hero, just like his grandpa before him. Best of all, the work wasn't finished because the robotic explorers continued to send pictures and information back from Jupiter. There is so much data to analyze that children around the world were soon making their own discoveries and dreaming about their own trips to new worlds. As for Max, he was just glad to get back home. It was his friends who understood the significance of it all. There may be life on other worlds, but no other known world has anything like the teeming life that thrives in every imaginable place on our home planet. Thanks to Max, they understood better than ever that Earth is a living planet and that all of our lives depend on taking good care of this remarkable world. And there's the picture of Earth. As you can see, there's all kinds of living things on Earth and it is a wonderful planet. 
and I actually only have uh, less than two weeks left up here on the International Space Station. I've been up here for a little more than five, uh, five months, and so it's time for me to return to Earth, and I have to say I'm, I'm looking forward to it. My trip up here has been absolutely fantastic, but, uh, but it is time to go home. So thank you for letting me spend some time with you in story time from space. I've absolutely uh, enjoyed it and look forward to maybe getting to do it again in the future. Bye-bye.